Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim, I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in the United Kingdom and today we're going to be discussing case number 44 from our ECG Facebook page. So, the case we're going to talk about is an interesting one. It was uh, for a 68 year old male patient presented to ED with acute onset of palpitations uh, of two hours duration. So when the patient presented to the ED, uh, there was no chest pain, no signs of heart failure, no signs of decompensation. The vital signs were all okay, apart from the heart rate that was on the fast side. He's had an ECG and uh, this was his ECG. As usual, I'd like you to hit the pause button have a proper look at the ECG and try to analyze it yourself and let's see if you can figure out what is going on here. Okay, hope you've done what we've agreed to do. Uh, let's move on and see how it goes. Let's analyze this ECG ourselves. As we said before, there is a suggested approach that I would like you to follow. Follow whatever you fancy, um, but I think this approach is a good one and this is what I personally use all the time. Always look at the QRS and ask yourself four questions. What's the rate doing? What's the rhythm doing? What's the width like? And what's the axis doing? Then have a look at the P waves and its relation to the QRS. Have a look at the two important intervals that we're interested in, PR interval and QT interval. Then check for chamber enlargement. And then check for signs of ischemia. So that includes assessing the ST segment, the T waves and the Q waves and then anything else. So if we're going to apply this to our ECG for today, let's see. Let's start with our first three questions, rate, rhythm and width. And let's see what we're going to come up with. In terms of the rate here, it was about 135 to 140. So, um, so we are on the tacky side. In terms of the rhythm, this is a regular rhythm. And in terms of the width, that complex looks narrow to me. So in summary, we are dealing with a narrow complex regular tachycardia. So this is a really important differential diagnosis that you need to know by heart. When we talk about narrow complex tachycardia, you should split them into two big groups, regular group and irregular group. The irregular ones are three, so it's either AF, so that's narrow complex irregular tachycardia, or atrial flutter with variable conduction or variable block, or multifocal atrial tachycardia. So these are the three that will cause you to have an irregular, uh, irregular narrow complex tachy. The regular ones are three as well. They're either sinus tachy, or SVT, or atrial flutter with a fixed block or a fixed conduction. So these are the six differential diagnoses for a narrow complex tachy. And uh, considering that we are dealing with a regular rhythm today, then our differential is going to be either sinus tachy or SVT or atrial flutter with a fixed conduction. I guess the question is, is it really important to differentiate the three? Well, of course, yes, treatment is very different. So if you're thinking sinus tachy, we'd not really treat sinus tachy, we'd treat the cause for it. Treat the dehydration, treat the sepsis, treat the pulmonary embolism, treat whatever caused the sinus tachy and it will fix itself. But do not try to rate control a sinus tachycardia patient. If it is an SVT, then probably you're gonna go down the vagal maneuvers and try to give some medications like adenosine or verapamil or whatever um, is in your local policy. Um, if it is an atrial flutter, then you might think about rate control rather than rhythm control if it is an old rhythm or if you're not sure. Um, and, and, and you will need to consider the need for anticoagulation. So treatment is very different. So it's really important to differentiate the three. So which one out of the three is the diagnosis here? This is our question now. And the only way to find out is by looking at the P waves. The answer is there. If you can see one P wave before each complex, that's a sinus tachycardia. If you can see more than one P wave before each complex, that is an atrial flutter. If you cannot really see P waves at all, that is an SVT. 
So it's all about the P waves in this rhythm. We've talked about this before as well. So in terms of where to check for P waves, the best lead to check for P waves is usually V1. And the reason for this is this. This is, um, as you know, our SA node. So um, let's draw some stuff in here. So this is our SA node and um, that send the impulse to the AV node to spread it to the ventricle. And if you imagine where we put our leads, you will notice that actually V1 is kind of straight over the SA node. So V1 is usually the best lead to check for P waves. So let's have a look at our V1 and C. This is V1, V2, V3 in our case. And to be fair, I cannot really see any convincing P waves um, in there. I mean, you, you might argue that, uh, is this a thing here? But um, to be honest, I'm not that convinced. So V1 didn't give me the answer in this rhythm. But the other thing that you need to be aware of is, it is not just about V1. If you cannot see anything in V1, you must check everywhere else in the ECG. And if you do so, you will find some interesting stuff when you move on to lead two and lead three. Looking there, actually, I think I can see something here that looks like a P wave. And in lead three, actually, it's far more obvious. There are stuff here that they look like P waves. So once you see P waves that are that far from the complex, I would automatically exclude SVT out of my differential because it, you might see some P waves in SVT, but they'll be very close to the complex, usually just after or maybe just before. But this is just too far. These ones are too far from the complexes to the point that I would say this, this cannot be an SVT. So that will leave us with one of two things. Either this is a sinus tachy with a first degree heart block, or this is a nature of flutter. Clue here is where the P waves are. So when I saw this ECG, what caught my eye was the position of the P wave. It is kind of just in the middle between the two complexes. And there is a name for this that you should be aware of. This is called the Bix rule. So let's talk about this important rule for a minute. Bix rule is being named after Harold Bix. He's one of the important names in the cardiology and arrhythmia world. And he stated that whenever you see P waves that appear halfway between two QRS complexes, there is a high chance that there will be P waves hidden in the complex before and the complex after. So let's try to apply this again. Looking at our one, according to this rule, if you think that this is a P wave and it is just in the middle between two complexes, then it means that there might be a P wave that is hidden in here and another one hidden in there, but you cannot see them because they are hidden. So when I, up, when I applied this rule, I started seeing things that I couldn't see before. I started noticing that actually there is something here and here that is not here and not there. So those are parts of the P waves that are hidden within the complex. So in complex uh, number one, so in this complex, the, the P wave is completely hidden within the complex. That's why the, the, this area is nice and smooth and there is nothing to see. While in this one, there is that notch here because that is the junction between a P wave that is hidden within the complex and, uh, and the complex itself. And if you map them, they will map very regularly. So you can clearly tell that those are P waves. Knowing this, that means that we're dealing with atrial flutter. This is another example for the Bex rule. Uh, that we have um, discussed again on the Facebook page a while ago. This was a 95 year old lady who presented with palpitations. And again, it is a bit difficult to say whether this is a atrial flutter or SVT. This is just a narrow complex regular tachy. But again, 
if you make things bigger, you will notice that we've got here what looks like a P wave just in the middle between two complexes. So according to Beck's rule, there is a chance that there is a P wave in the complex before and the complex after. After rate controlling this lady, we started clearly seeing the flutter waves. So this was another HF flutter. So let's go back to our case and I'll tell you what happened. So again, this was a 68 year old male patient presented to ED with acute onset of palpitations uh, of two hours duration. There was no chest pain or any signs of decompensation. The heart rate was fast. We've done an ECG and this was the ECG. So when we saw this ECG, uh, we put the differential that we've discussed before. And, um, and as I said, we've been uh, more towards atrial flutter because of um, the Bix rule um, and the application of it regarding this ECG. So our decision um, was to try to um, maybe assess for signs of sepsis and start some rate control, uh, give a fluid bolus and see where we are. But just before starting any treatment while transferring the patient from the ambulance trolley to the um, ED trolley, the heart rate changed. So we repeated the ECG and now you can see clearly that we are dealing with atrial flutter rather than with a sinus tachy with a first degree heart block or with an SVT. So in summary, what we've talked about today is having a systematic approach is always useful when you deal with any ECG, especially with the complicated ones. Atrial flutter is a commonly missed tachyarrhythmia that requires careful ECG interpretation because missing it um, will result in a mistreatment for your patient. And remember the Bix rule. It is an important rule that will help you a lot diagnosing subtle atrial flutter. And this was it about this week's case. So uh, thank you very much for your interaction over the Facebook page. And I hope you find this useful and I will try my best to talk to you very soon. Stay safe and bye for now.